Okay, so yeah, we're going to get started here. Thank you, everyone, uh, physically present here in the room and those that are joining us online. It's my very pleasure to introduce Eloisa Raluy Lopez, uh, our speaker today. She's a PhD student from the University of Murcia in, uh, in Murcia, Spain, and uh, she's been working with us uh, during the last couple of months. Uh, you're going to be surprised when you see so many great work and so on all happening uh, within a couple of months. So there's a lot of uh, good stuff here. Uh, going from mesoscale modeling to lots of fast data, looking into land cover uh, and, and roughness uh, uh, issues and, and problems on the ground. So uh, trying to avoid here to spoil the, the seminar for you. I'm just going to uh, uh, let's welcome uh, Eloisa and, and uh, uh, have the, the seminar before her. So a little applause. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending this seminar, both in person and virtually. Um, I wanted to just tell you that if you have any questions, comments, suggestions during the presentation, don't hesitate to stop me, and we can discuss it during the presentation to make this uh, a little more interactive. Please don't wait till the end of the presentation. And today, we're going to talk about the impact of land cover and skin forcings in microscale weather simulations across urban rural heterogeneous landscapes. The motivation of this study is that, as you may already know, uh, land cover data sets with scalar solutions are typically used in atmospheric models, um, but they may be unable to represent some relevant local features. And in fact, in microscale turbulence resolving simulations, the role of the surface forcings arising from this more realistic land cover and skin properties is poorly understood, especially in urban areas. Also, they are crucial to address modern urban challenges like urban heat island effects, transport and dispersion, and urban induced clouds. However, thanks to building resolving large eddy simulations with detailed land cover and surface characteristics, uh, we are now able to explore how these factors influence urban micrometeorology. In particular, in this study, we've used the FASTEDI model, which is a GPU-accelerated LES model that is an order of magnitude faster than regular CPU-accelerated uh, uh, yeah, CPU LES models. So with that in mind, our objective uh, is to explore the impacts of varying land cover classifications in both... Whoop, OK. <laughs> in both resolution and granularity and their corresponding surface characteristics, like the roughness length, on microscale weather simulations across urban rural heterogeneous landscapes. And for that purpose, we've chosen to focus our study in the region of Murcia, which is located in the southeast of Spain, in, in Europe, and is a region with a Mediterranean and semi-arid climate with very hot summers, mild winters, scarce rains. And we focused our study in its capital city, the city of Murcia, which is located in a valley between two mountain ranges. It's mainly surrounded by crop fields, as you can see in this image. Its city center is crossed by a river and mainly formed by narrow and irregular streets. And it also has an expanded area with larger and regular blocks. OK, so we have our scientific questions, and to answer them, we've decided to perform a series of coupled wharf and fast eddy simulations that mainly need uh, three ingredients. The geographical data to describe the characteristics of the surface, uh, our simulation, which will give us the initial and boundary conditions from the, for the microscale simulations, and the fast eddy model, which is going to allow us to, per, uh, to perform the microscale simulations. I, will, uh, I also like to mention that the WARF and FASTEDI configurations are going to be the same for all the experiments, uh, but we are going to change the geographical data, in particular the land cover and the roughness length. Then I'm going to show you some preliminary results, but keep in mind that we already have uh, many open questions that we are going to address in the near future. So uh, let's start with the geographical data. All the geographical data used in this study was derived from open access data uh, of the National Geographic Institute of Spain. 
And we've designed this 20 by 20 kilometers domain center on the city of Murcia. And we needed this geographical data to have a final resolution of one meter and to have the same projection than the world simulations, which in this case, we've chosen to be this uh, Lambert conformal conic center on zero degrees longitude and 40 degrees latitude. The terrain elevation showed here had an original grid cell of two meters, while the building heights had an original grid cell of two and a half meters. We've prepared the building height data to have a level of detail 1.3, which means that as you are seeing here in this figure, um, all the building surfaces are going to be flat, but the different parts of the buildings are allowed to have different heights. And now for the land cover, we want the final classification to be the default classification used in Word, which is the modified IGBP MODIS NOAA, 20 categories. And uh, our data is coming from two different data sets, CORIN, which is a European effort, and COSE, which is mainly uh, national. The first one, CORIN, CORIN land cover, uh, has 44 categories and also it has a 100 meter resolution, it has a minimum polygon of 25 hectares. And when we use the, the conversion table derived uh, by Vogel and Safari in 2020, uh, we obtain the distribution of the land cover represented here. And as you can see, there are uh, some local features missing, for instance, the river that might be crossing the city center. <coughs> So we decided to uh, also work with a second database for the land cover, which is CIOS, and has a, it is a higher resolution data set. Originally, it has 46 categories, and it has a minimum polygon of, instead of 25 hectares, of two hectares in natural areas, and one hectare, around 10 meters, around 100 meters, if we consider a, a squared polygon, uh, in urban areas. We've designed the, the conversion table ourselves, and when we apply them to the data, these are the results. And as you can see here, we have road networks, the river, and you know, smaller polygons, more detail. Uh, now, also using the, the COC land cover data set, we wanted to have a, a third land cover possibility. Um, introducing in the MODIS classification the local climate zones. Um, as many of you may already know, the local climate zones are some extra categories to better describe the urban variability. Uh, in, in this case, uh, when you combine them with MODIS, you have 11 extra urban categories and the natural categories are the same as in MODIS. So with this, we wanted to obtain not only a higher resolution in land cover, but also a higher granularity by having more categories. And in red, uh, there are the changes that one needs to uh, add to the conversion table to also have the local climate zones. And here for you to compare the three uh, possibilities of land cover, um, we have on the left the Corin to Modis land cover, which is the one with the lowest resolution. Then we pass to another uh, land cover data set, which is COSE. So we have an increased land cover resolution. And using, again, COSE, but converting it to MODIS, including the local climate zones, we have not only an increased resolution, but also an increased granular granularity. However, now we need uh, our fourth and last, or yeah, our fourth and last uh, geographical data magnitude, which is the roughness length. And it consists on uh, assigning a roughness length value for each land cover category. And we've used it, uh, and to make this, we've used the land use table of WORF. And as you can see here, uh, even though we have 20 categories, um, many of them got combined, and we have just three, four, five values, five different values of roughness length. So we are losing uh, lots of details and the, the vast part of the variability that we have achieved with the land cover. So to solve this problem, uh, we have proposed um, more realistic roughness length values 
uh, for all the categories used in Word. Um, for instance, as you can see here, the four first categories uh, that are forest, they have exactly the same values in Word, but now uh, they have uh, more distinguished uh, values. The, mm, this new proposal was derived from different sources, including the documentation of the local climate zones. So this was what we had before the implementation of the new values. And this is what we have now, that we have included more realistic roughness length uh, values with more variability. So also we have here six different possibilities to study the changes in roughness length, land cover, etc. cetera. Uh, for this presentation, I'm only going to focus on these three. Uh, at the beginning, we were uh, also going to include the one that has the local climate zones. But as the natural classifications are the same as in uh, simple modest uh, classification, and the differences in the urban areas were quite small, um, we are just going to focus on these three. So we have what we are going to call the Corine Wharf uh, configuration, and then we have the COC Wharf, which has uh, both of them have the roughness length values coming from the land use table of WORF, but they have an increased resolution. And then for the same resolution, we have more granularity by using more realistic roughness length values. So these are going to be the main differences between our three experiments. OK, now that we have the geographical data, let's head to the WORF configuration. We have three one-way nested domains with a resolution of 9, 3, and 1 kilometers. The initial and boundary conditions were derived from the ERA-5 reanalysis. And we've, of course, used the land cover classification from MODIS with 20 categories. And we have 45 uh, vertical levels with uh, a higher density of levels near the surface. We've used the last version of the WORF model, and we've decided to call this configuration the default configuration. Because we've, uh, in terms of the physics, we've just used the default configuration of the physics suite conus. And we haven't included a new run parameterization. With this experiment, uh, we've performed a series of um, a year of simulations of three of 36 hour runs with 12 hours spin up and then the full day from April 2023 to March 2024 20, uh, to uh, be able to select some case studies. Today I'm going to show you one. And just for you to compare, this is the 20 by 20 domain of the land use index that WORF is, consider, is considering compared to what we have obtained uh, with the geographical data. And now our last ingredient, the Fastedi LES model. Uh, we have designed uh, this 15, yes, 15 by 15 kilometers domain with a 10 meter resolution in both the horizontal and the vertical. However, in the vertical, we have uh, this increment of 10 meters at the surface, but then we have a vertical stretching. And the top of the atmosphere here is located at around 2.7 kilometers. We had a time step of 0.02 seconds and an output frequency of five minutes. Also, another novelty here is that we have included in the fast steady model a local tearing smoothing method that I'm going to briefly comment in the next slides. But now, heading back to the, to the physics of the model, we've used the fifth order upwind advection scheme, the Deardorff's 1.5 TGE subgrid scale model the most based surface layer scheme. For the microphysics, saturation, there is a saturation adjustment for condensation and evaporation processes and non-precipitating clouds. Another novelty is that we have included in the model a, a dynamical thermal roughness length calculation following the Silitinkevich approach. And for the turbulence scheme, we think, uh, we've used the Deardorff 1.5 level TGE and the cell perturbation method for turbulence generation. As I've said before, these microscale simulations are coupled with the WARF simulation. So we have here WARF driven initial and boundary conditions that were updated in FASTEDI uh, every five minutes and were linearly interpolated in time. And we have five domain boundaries, which are the laterals and the top, because the 
uh, fast edit model is embedded inside the, the WORF domain. And in these boundaries, uh, all the prognostic variables of WORF were included. And the QV skin and skin temperature directly provide the input to the surface layer model of fast edit. And this is important. Also, we have prepared the building height uh, data. In this first set of simulation, no building effects were included. But we have uh, already prepared them for a second set of simulations once we know how the land cover and, surf and skin forcings affect the simulations. Now, coming back to the local and terrain smoothing method, as you may already know, there's a theoretical limit of around 40 degrees of maximum terrain slope um, to avoid instabilities in terrain following models like war for fast steady. And what these models usually do is just to apply a full domain smoothing method, like a Gaussian filter for all the, the domain. But for instance, in this case, uh, in, the, in the case of the terrain for the city of Murcia, here on the left you have the, the terrain with a 10 meter resolution. Due to just to a 1% of problematic points, we go from this resolution to this resolution. So to gain some details in the, in the simulation, we try to apply different uh, local smoothing methods. The first of them uh, is the simple local 3x3 three three method, which consists in just applying a Gaussian filter to this area. Then the second method is exactly the same, but the border points are a combination of the smooth and original terrains according to a blending factor. Then the third method is the same idea, but expanded in, in space, and the points are smoothed according to their distance to the center. And then we have the two simultaneous methods, with, uh, which are just the second and third method, but all the problematic points are treated uh, in the same iteration. Here you can see the number of problematic points and the maximum slope uh, decreasing with the number of iterations, iterations, and also the running time of every method. And these uh, figures over here represent the differences of every method using different parameters uh, with respect to the original theory. So the simple 3 by 3 method, for instance, did not reach convergence in this number of iterations. Uh, obviously, simultaneous methods are faster. And uh, the simultaneous 3 by 3 method with a blending factor of 0.2 is this one, presents the smallest changes while maintaining a reasonable running time. For instance, this is the fastest method, 10 minutes. This is the one that we've included in Fast Teddy because it has the smallest changes, 12 minutes, and then the third one took uh, 20 minutes. So this is a comparison of the general smoothing method with our local smoothing method that we have included in Fast Teddy. And the differences with the original terrain. Okay, now that we have our simulations ready, I'm going to show you some preliminary results. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, the results for the case study uh, of the 27th of May, 2023. Here in these animations, you are seeing the heat flux and the wind speed at 15 meters. Uh, and this figure over here represents the temperature at two meters and the wind components uh, for the center of the domain that the work simulation uh, that was present in the output of the work simulation. It was a hot and windy day without presence of rain in the microscale domain. And we have an approximately constant temperature and wind during the study for our window. And this Quasi-stationary period is uh, particularly helpful when studying spatial heterogeneities from a, from a statistical perspective. And also we have uh, running a four-hour simulation with removed the 25 first minutes as the spin-up time. Okay, we want to study urban and rural areas separately. And I've already shown you this uh, distribution. This is the land cover of the of the Corinne database, which was the one with the lowest resolution. And we've used it to uh, delimit the masks uh, 
for the urban and rural areas that you can see here. Okay. Now in this slide, uh, I'm presenting you the vertical profiles for the urban area. Uh, specifically for the horizontal components of the wind, the potential temperature, and the mixing ratio. And as you can see, the differences uh, decrease with, alti with altitude. So here we have a zoom uh, on the 21st uh, vertical levels. As you can observe here, uh, Corine Wharf is the experiment represented in red. COC Wharf is the one represented with this dashed blue line. And COC, but with the new roughness length values, is the uh, is the one represented in orange, yellow. As you can see, there's no big uh, there's no big differences between Corine and COC when when we have the same uh, roughness length conversion for the categories, but we have higher dif uh, bigger differences when we implement the the roughness length, the more realistic roughness length values, especially in, in the wind speed. There's no, also there's no changes in wind direction, only in the modulus. This is mainly due to differences in the effective roughness of the surface. And we have around uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.30 uh, degrees of potential temperature differences near the surface. And there's very small differences in the mixing radio because the, the skin mixing radio is the same for all the simulations and is the, the one coming from, from the worst simulations. And we observe similar magnitudes of the differences between the experiments uh, compared to the urban area for the uh, rural points. And I, I wanted to clarify that also the differences may seem uh, small here in the vertical profiles. They are just uh, spatial and temporal means of the variable, so the signal may be uh, hidden. So uh, let's head to the spatial distribution of the, of the magnitudes. Here we have the three experiments, just as a quick reminder, from Corine Wharf to COC Wharf, we just have a, a higher roughness length uh, resolution. And between COC Wharf and COC New, we have a higher roughness length granularity with this uh, new values of roughness length. However, they all have the same mesoscale forcings coming from Wharf, which means that the um, land cover and particularly roughness length values, uh, because it's a key component, uh, a key parameter in the Monino book of equations, they are going to mainly and directly impact the surface fluxes, like friction velocity and heat flux, and then they are going to impact the rest of the variables, like wind or temperature. So here we have the spatial distributions of the three experiments, and here you can see the differences between this, these two with the uh, reference experiment, which is going to be Corin Worf. And also, this is the temporal uh, mean of the fields. Here, in the probability density functions, uh, we've included uh, all the time steps. In the case of the friction velocity, for instance, you can see that uh, for the urban area in COC world, we have this secondary peak due to the presence of the road networks, the river, etc. And in when we compare COC new with the other two, we have um, a reduction of the friction velocity in both the, the urban and rural areas. And this is going to, uh, of course, affect the wind speed. For instance, this is the wind speed at 15 meters. Um, as you can see, for instance, in the, in the probability distribution functions, um, these two are for the U component, and this is the V component. Uh, we observed uh, bigger differences in both uh, urban and rural areas when introducing changes in, in roughness length values. Uh, however, there are small differences when only increasing resolution of the land cover data set, which is the difference between the red and blue lines. And these differences are particularly small in the rural area, which is a result that we were 
kind of expecting because the rural areas usually have bigger polygons. So with a lower resolution land cover data set, you already have those areas well defined. And in the case of the heat flux, this is one of our main results because the changes are quite impressive. <laughs> um, we can, you can see here, for instance, that in the case of COC new, which has the new roughness length values, we have uh, for values of around 300, 400 value, um, yeah, values in the other two experiments. Here we have a difference of more than 100 watts per meter square. And in the probability density functions, we see that we still have this peak related with the city center area, but uh, oops, sorry, but the rest <laughs> still present uh, now presents uh, higher values for the for the heat flux, and in the rural area, um, the the changes uh, are not as big, but are quite significant. And in terms of the potential temperature as we were expecting from the heat flux, um, we have uh, an increase in, well, this, this shift, this displacement uh, for the potential temperature in the third experiment. Now I'm going to present you um, the values of the turbulent magnitudes. However, these turbulent magnitudes are computed a bit different from what you may have already seen before, because they are turbulent magnitudes from the neighborhood scale, which means that the anomalies, the variability used here to compute, for instance, the turbulent kinetic energy, uh, these are not with respect to the temporal mean, but they are with respect to the spatial mean of the coherent points, which means that we have the mean of the urban points for the urban turbulent kinetic energy and the mean of the rural points to compute the TKE for the rural area. And the same for the turbulent flux of any magnitude, I call this one C, for instance. These are the means of the spatial area. And then we compute the temporal mean. We've done this this way because we wanted to mainly study uh, spatial heterogeneities. Thank you. Is C just a passive tracer then? Could you repeat? Is C just a passive tracer, like concentration, what? No, C, C here is just any magnitude. And but C it doesn't interact directly, it's passive? No, it, it, it's going to be like momentum flux, uh, heat flux, and uh, oh. later on. So, oh, it's so it's that's like generic for all, yeah, all the quantities. Yeah, a general way to represent all the fluxes. In particular, but, tell me. I'm oh, sorry, good. Ah, no, I was going to say that in particular, as you can see here in the vertical profiles, uh, we've computed this for the wind speed, uh, well, the momentum uh, turbulent flux, the turbulent momentum flux, the turbulent uh, heat flux, and uh, of mixing radio. Are these results only, or is subgrid also considered in this? Yeah, are the, are, yeah, are the turbulent quantities resolved uh, only, or uh, do they have the subgrid scale? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, well, if if you look at the at the equation, like I've put it here, it will be just the resolved part, which is a ninety nine percent of the of yeah of the turbulent kinetic energy. Um, but we, I've also added the turbulent kinetic energy. Subgrid, yeah, the subgrid part, which is uh, an, an output variable from the first study model. Uh, I forgot to add here the, <laughs> the, the addition, but, but it's included. It's included. It's not only the result, but also it's quite small compared to the result part. Sorry, I missed what the averaging length is. Yeah, yeah, what, what the averaging uh, regions are, yeah, like point to the uh, figure. Oh, uh, the regions here. Yeah, I put the, the, the region here. The red points are the, re the urban area, and the blue points are the rural area, the rural points. 
Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I've already mentioned uh, which uh, magnitudes are presented here uh, in the vertical profiles. But uh, as before, the differences between them decrease with altitude. So I've just put the, uh, here the zoom to the 21st levels for the urban um, and rural areas. And as you can see here, also the, um, the turbulent heat flux presents uh, higher relative differences. Uh, it's an order of magnitude lower than the the turbulent momentum flux. So for this case, the the mechanical part is going to predominate over the buoyancy in the generation of turbulence and in the TKE. But this is just uh, a result specific for these meteorological conditions with very high winds. So in the near future, we want to study other cases with different meteorological conditions. And uh, well, as you can see here, the behavior of the differences between the experiments for the DKE uh, correspond, this reduction, correspond to the momentum turbulent flux. OK. Here, uh, also, I'm showing both areas, the urban and rural, in the same figure. Please don't forget that these values over here were computed using the mean of the red values and of the red points. And those for the rural area were just computed using only uh, the rural points. Again, we have the differences between the experiments. And as we have computed uh, a temporal mean to obtain the values, the probability density functions here just give us an idea of uh, the distribution that is represented here. As we've seen already in the vertical profiles, but uh, more clearly here, uh, we see a bigger reduction of the turbulent kinetic energy when we change the roughness length values, and in particular, this reduction of just one meter square per second squared. It's a big change for this magnitude. And in the case of the of the rural area, we don't see this shift, but instead, well, more or less, but instead we have a, a higher probability of the lowest values and a lower probability for the highest ones. And as we have already said before, this is consistent with the turbulent momentum flux, which is the one that it's predominating here. Uh, so we see this reduction. Always the differences are um, bigger when comparing uh, when we change the roughness length values. And for the turbulent heat flux, uh, we see this, uh, this shift to bigger and more positive values. Uh, also, the, these two experiments uh, behave quite similarly. Oops. Well. <laughs> OK, and now heading to this take home message, some conclusions derived from these preliminary results. As you've seen, the reference experiments represent a, a common way of working with WARF and FASTEDI because we've used the default configuration, the default land cover, no urban parameterization. Um, and we've seen that in both mesoscale and microscale simulations, configuration details especially here, land cover, roughness length, are crucial, leading to significant differences in surface fluxes and turbulence generation, as we've seen previously. And increasing land cover resolution alone, which would be the second experiment, while keeping the same default surface properties, results in very small differences, especially in rural areas, uh, because I've already mentioned the, <laughs> the cost. And increasing the granularity by using more realistic values of surface properties leads to significant differences, uh, even when maintaining the, the, the same resolution. However, we know that there's still many, many open questions. And for instance, uh, how is the effect of different meteorological conditions? Because here, as I've uh, said before, we had a very windy day. The mechanical component was predominating. But what would happen with a higher heat flux? 
Another open question is the impact of the mesoscale skin forcing resolution, because here we've used the, the WARF, uh, the third domain of WARF with a one kilometer resolution, but what happens if we increase that resolution? And then we haven't used uh, yet uh, a urban parametrization, but it could uh, have, well, it has an impact on the uh, skin forcing. So what is its influence? But don't worry, we have these questions in mind and we will try to uh, address them as soon as possible. So also uh, it says future work, it is more like current and future work because simulations are running while we are here talking. <laughs> so these are the, the main steps that we would like to consider. First of all, uh, we would like to study uh, two more case studies. For instance, uh, a low wind evening, so we can see what happens we ha when we have higher thermal effects. And for instance, another case with high stability and intermediate winds, which will be the more or less intermediate case. Then we would like to uh, add another work configuration uh, with local climate zones and uh, urban parametrization, not only the default, because this will lead to differences in mesoscale skin forcings. For instance, you are seeing here the skin temperature and the skin mixing radio from uh, between the default experiment, which is the one that I've already presented to you, and how they change when we include the local climate zones and this uh, second urban parametrization. The, um, all these uh, skin forcings are going to act as surface boundary conditions in the FASTD model, so they are going to introduce lots of changes. And the third point that we would like to assess as soon as possible is uh, to add one extra work domain with 200 meter resolution. And we'll try to activate the work LES model to see how the mesoscale resolution affects the simulation. And then for the second set of simulation that I, I mentioned before, we're going to include the building effects and also the transport and dispersion of pollutants within FASTEDI with a higher resolution, instead of 10 meters, five meters. And uh, last but not least, the comparison with urban and rural observation of, of the results. And that will be everything I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be glad to hear your questions, comments. Yeah, thank you, Luisa, for an excellent seminar. So we're going to take questions, any, uh, anyone from the room, and then we'll go online and, and see if there's something uh, from there. So anyone here present in the audience with some further? I mean, there have been already comments. Uh, speaking of observations, on your last slide, do you have any observations? Yes. In fact, we have lots of observations, but we mainly have them on the rural areas because they are derived from the Agricultural Institute of Murcia, but the uh, National Meteorological Agency has some urban stations, and we are trying to to, ob ob ah, okay. to obtain uh, those data, but there's lots of paperwork, that, of paperwork that we have to do first, but, but we'll, we'll have them soon. My other question is, um, if you can go back to the vertical profiles of velocity, comparing the urban and rural areas. Yeah. So, I mean, this doesn't look logarithmic over the rural areas, which you'd expect. Um, but the fact that it's not logarithmic at low levels, does that, how does that affect your computation of friction velocity. Yes. So uh, that, that's a good point, uh, Bob. The, the reason why they're not logarithmic is because uh, there are thermal effects also. So it, it's going to be a log with, with some departure from a, from a true clean logarithmic uh, profile. But in any case, in the end, for, for the modern of Bukov similarity theory, it, it doesn't assume, it has a thermal uh, correction for stability. So it can be any kind of a, a profile, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a near neutral condition with a, a logarithmic uh, line. Right. Well, it's just interesting. I mean, what, it'd be nice to have a lot. I mean, a logarithmic profile to compare to to see how 
much has changed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, we'll keep it in mind. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I just noticed in your last slide uh, where in your default settings, uh, actually in the city center, you have lower temperature than the rural area. Uh, is that a concern? Or, because uh, if, if we think about the urban heat island effect, typically we see a warmer temperature over city yes, center. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the first figure. Well, the, the explanation to your question maybe may lead you to how the skin temperature of the of the wolf, <laughs> of the mass scale is introduced in the model because as you see here, this is uh, quite wider than the actual city, so that's why we see the city and then more heat flux. It's yeah, that, due to the mesoscale. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, going back to your uh, question, uh, the the, uh, the reason why you say what you see is because that work without an urban permutation. So, in the end, yeah. the city, it's a high roughness element that I don't have a hard time, you know, like fluxing vertically heat. So eventually it's it gonna look like, a, and it's strong wind, right? So it's it gonna be like a, so that's what people will get if they run wharf without an urban permutation, and that's kind of our uh, default uh, control case. But uh, Eloisa was saying like, she's already running the, the one that you can see on the, yeah, the second panel, which already shows you a little bit of a warmer uh, yes. kind of city center. But yeah, that's, uh, but yeah, that, that kind of just, just saying, if you take a wharf, as many people do, right? And you run it as it is, and you don't take the time to set up your, you know, like land categories and everything of parametrization, you, you can see things like that. And, uh, and that's gonna have an impact for sure. So that's uh, coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. For the high resolution um, land use, is it possible to try to somehow group them, because averaging it will kind of make it useless, but group them by majority and compare that to what wharf is seeing, just to see what your baseline difference is between wharf's land use and what you, like the the new high resolution is. Just they're very different. So, like, do you have a picture? Um, yeah, you have. Do you mean that to do this comparison, right? Ah. Let me <laughs> lots of slides to do something like this, but. Uh, computing the averages of these yeah. pixels with these to compare them. To, right? to try to get your high resolution data set somehow averaged, like it won't be averaged, but like the majority in a, in a cell. So you could compare. Um, I think it's already dominant. Say that? Yeah. What? It's already dominant. Yeah, yeah but what that? It's already dominant. Yeah. Well, yes. From the same data set? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I like. Work comes from the uh, yeah. Which one was it? Uh, the wharf. Yeah, the wharf. The Korean bodies, uh, correct? This body is uh, fifteen arc second. Yes, it's a different. Uh, you know, so th that already the, the whole kind of upscaling uh, aggregation kind of thing. And yeah, and so I guess I'm wondering from these data sets, just how far off would they be if you ran wharf with? the new data sets, because they would do the upscaling as well. Yeah, yeah, that would um, be. To do the upscale of these distributions and compare them with yeah. what work is in. That would be interesting. Yeah. Just because then like, your your initial and boundary conditions from WARF, if running with the new high resolution data sets, could change the, like, Yes, well, yeah. yeah. We actually have one more experiment that hasn't been, at least I haven't presented, that it's actually yes. running with the exact same WARF. Uh, Land cover, so the one you see okay. there, and oh. kind of like control, control. Yeah, how much yeah. it can be for 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 a reference. Yeah. Yes. But then yeah, we are we are hoping that uh, now going down to as uh, Luisa was saying to two hundred meters at that point now, we're already going to see something yeah. that for the city of Murcia and the kind of the heterogeneity is going to be pretty pretty close, and then they're going to sh kind of emphasize more differences in the other changes rather than the forcing itself. But uh, it, it's like a multi parameter uh, problem. So yeah. this is a kind of a, trying to keep one thing constant and then you change all the other ones. But uh, we were talking about the other day, uh, how many simulations, Eloisa, were we saying that uh, we were going to need like 
minimum 50 48. simulation or, or, yeah. or something to, to have kind of like cover the whole parameter space. And this is just kind of the very first uh, uh, glance at the at preliminary results. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any more questions in the room? Uh, no? Oh, yeah, one more here. And then we're moving to the online. Um, hi, thank you. This is a great presentation. I have a question to your third simulation treatment. How did you derive the zero? Maybe I, I missed it. So how did you derive the zero, uh, the Z zero parameter from this third one? Is it like a parameter base? Or, and following on that, do you treat a Z zero M, the momentum transport, and then the Z zero H differently? Maybe you can answer the second question and I can answer the uh -huh. first one. Uh -huh. uh, if I understood you correctly, um, you are asking me like how we have derived the new roughness length values, right? If, well, to be honest, it was just a combination of uh, natural intelligence, the stool micrometeorology book, and the, the values that other models typically use, also work, and the documentation of the local climate zones, I mean. Uh, we've chosen these values, but we will have to use 0 0.66 instead of 0 0.67. But um, according to different papers, books, etc., they seem like more consistent, realistic values. Well, so it's not purely observation-based, it's based on literature. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I guess, yeah, as you well know, suddenly I mean, a huge scatter, and, and you know, even from observation to yeah, it, it's a observation that go into literature, right? So yeah, but we didn't do that with our local information there or, uh, no, or anything. Not local. Just and uh, local. going back to the ther yeah, thermal and, and momentum roughnesses are different. Uh, we used to have uh, there used to be like a constant factor, like typically a factor of ten we were using. But actually, all those simulations include some new developments. So we have the Silitinkevich uh, approach for for thermal. Which is basically the, the uh, momentum times an exponential that then it's a function of friction velocity. So yeah, the higher the friction velocity, the more wind, the less you're gonna have uh, uh, z not temperature, and then moisture and temperature they are uh, they are both the same. Mm -hmm. Any more questions in the room? Then yeah, let's move on with the with the online. One from Chris I Rosava. I forgot I forgot from conversation I've had with Jeremy and this in the past, but. Does FASTATI have an immersed boundary condition to implicitly represent building in the domain? And thank you for the very nice presentation. So I'll, I'll take that one, I guess. Uh, yes, it does. It, it's a flavor. It's not an IVM. It's an IVFM that actually we kind of developed. Uh, but yes, it, it does uh, have that model. And then following question from Matthias. Uh, this one is for you, Eloisa. Uh, okay. so Matthias, very Matthias. So if you had a magic one. <laughs> So which current problem that you're experiencing you'll uh, uh, like to go away? If, if you could kind of remove one, uh, one problem. Problem related with this presentation, yes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know, maybe I'd, I, I would have like to have already the, the other world configuration with a higher resolution, um, but we had some problems trying to, to run those simulations but we'll manage to do, to do them in the near future. So, yeah, I wish I had a magic one, but I don't have it. <laughs> and I guess, extending on that, Matthias, uh, uh, problem, problems, uh, I don't think we have any problem. We have lots of opportunities. And uh, what we have in the model, it, it's a model that uh, any other model is just wrong by definition, but it's useful. And there are many uncertainties, and this work that, I mean, the excellent work that, uh, that Eloisa is carrying out, just trying to understand what the uncertainties are. Because eventually, we want to do forecasting and we need to understand, you know, how do we need to configure our simulation? How much does it matter? And uh, so it's just part of, the, part of the game. I don't think we want anything to go away. We just want to do more work to, to understand how much everything matters and then just be smart about how to design our, our forecasting systems for the micro scale uh, uh, in the near future. So I guess any, any more question, comments uh, from the room? Uh, anything else online, Richard? No. Very good. OK, so then I guess let's uh, give Eloise another warm uh, round of applause. And uh, thank her for her good seminar. Thanks for coming to this seminar.